For Krima Media in Johannesburg, I am Sane Lamini, Director of the Institute for Safety Governance in the Global South, Mark Shaw, is in conversation with Quality about his book titled, Give Us More Guns. This book details how South Africa's gangs were armed. Would you mind sharing with our viewers how the SAPS colonel Christian Prinslow sold the arms that were supposed to be destroyed to the underworld gangs? Thanks, Sonny. The, the, the book covers the details of how he did that. And, and basically, he was in charge of the armory in Gauteng. And the armory uh, took weapons from three sources, really. Firstly, the decommissioned police guns. So the, the famous Z88 produced uh, in, in the late 1980s. Then guns that had been handed in in amnesties. Uh, and then also guns which had been seized by the police in roadblocks uh, for purposes of evidence, guns from the so-called SAPS-13 stores. And over time, beginning in the mid to late 2000s, uh, he spotted, I think, a marketing opportunity to sell guns that were meant to be destroyed in an untraceable way uh, to, to the underworld. And there's some evidence that he he first looked at the, the KZN market and then uh, started to sell uh, to, to the market in the Western Cape. And he did this through an intermediary and he bulk supplied the guns to the Western Cape gangs. And the book explains that quite complex process in, in which he, he did that. And he got away with it for, frankly, several years, uh, Sonny. And it was so bizarre how he, he said uh, he wanted to fund studies for his son uh, in such a, a very bad way, if I may say so. And if you, if I may ask, uh, Mark, these guns, as you've just said, they've spread all over the country now. Can you tell us why they were called um, the Zulus? Because I know from the book they were called the Z88. Yeah, for me, this was a very, if you like, symbolic point. A significant portion of the guns that were sold to the gangs were Z88s. Now, Z88s were a copy of the Beretta produced in the last days of apartheid rule as a sidearm for the police and, and the military. And they were produced in relatively large numbers and, and the, the police were, were armed. Amongst gangsters, they are called the Zulu. One reason for that is because they are locally produced. And, and gang members uh, reported to me actually many times that they, they like the Zulu, that it's a durable gun and that it's South African made, the sense it has imprinted on the barrel made in South Africa. So this weird idea that actually South African guns are, are good guns and that was sort of articulated by gang members linked to that which is very interesting as you know from the book is that gang members like the z88 because they're a police gun and the psychology of this is extremely interesting for me that a police gun gives them authority like the police and and you can see quotes like that in the book that the z88 because the police carry them uh, are, are something that have a degree of symbolic value uh, also for, for gang members. And I guess that's a kind of reverse psychology, reverse authority. And, and that's important in the sense that gang members often are forms of authority in their communities. They provide food, they provide to some degree security, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a range of logistical reasons why the Z88 is seen as good. It, it, uh, uh, it can have an extended uh, magazine. It's very durable. And gang members point all of those sort of practical elements um, out. So it's all of these reasons uh, why the Z88, in my view, and, and as you know, I then focused on, on that um, as part of the book. And, and because Prince Lua delivered relatively large consignments of, of Z88s with their identifying numbers removed. And then in the book, you mentioned the death of a lawyer who may have crossed the line uh, while working as a lawyer, Hassan. He, even his funeral was attended by a lot of gangster leaders and people who are also working for the underworld gangs. Can you tell us about what you have uncovered about Hassan? Hassan is a very interesting figure, Sonia. And if, a first point, just to dwell a little bit on the funeral, there's some very interesting literature which which is in the academic domain about why 
underworld funerals are important places for in fact exposing connections that connections that you wouldn't ordinarily see in the day-to-day -day business in the press etc are often exposed around the world and as it turns out in South Africa at, at funerals and that people attend because they've had some sort of connection and, and uh, people in the underworld told me actually people also attended the funeral because if they stayed away they might uh, uh, be seen in the wider un underworld as a suspect in Hassan's killing. Hassan was this interesting gang lawyer. He, he seemed to provide services to a range of gangs. He had a, a lot of connections to individual gang bosses. I have been told by, by uh, many people how one of his functions was to get people out on bail, uh, to move around different police stations. There were allegations that money may have changed hands um, in those transactions. And that also he maintained uh, trust funds for gang bosses. And that may have been one of the reasons that he was killed, in fact, that because he was working for different gangsters, because he became drawn into the economy, he became vulnerable. And I sense the role he played was that he was an interface between the upper and underworld in, in some very strange ways, including, for example, asking uh, local doctors whether they would treat uh, outside of the official health system, uh, wounded gang members. So he sort of crossed, uh, he was a bridge between the underworld and the upper world. And he played a key role as a defender in initially in the gang's case um, of the intermediary, uh, but he clearly represented a large number of underworld figures in the court system. He was indeed a controversial figure, if I may say so, because even his case was difficult to solve because the evidence has, had been tempered with and it became difficult for the police and some people were even scared to talk about uh, this matter. His cell phone disappeared at a police station. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I mean, first point to make, uh, Sunny, is that his murder has never been solved. Mm -hmm. I point uh, to a, a alleged uh, a suspect who I think, from my own information, killed him. That was the hitman, a, a kind of practiced, very violent individual uh, who, who you know is identified in, in the book. But his case, the Hassan case, was never solved. And one reason it was never solved is that local detectives at the local police station were too scared to take it forward. The file went to the provincial hawks and, and down again, back to the detectives moving around. Uh, nobody ever really wants it and wants this case to be solved. Um, and then, as you say, there are several activities around the case which are deeply suspicious. So I, I point only to two. One is that his, his mobile phone, which would have uh, some identifiers about who he had been in contact with, et cetera, et cetera, simply disappeared from, from the police station in very suspicious circumstances. Secondly, there, there was a CCTV camera overviewing the, the murder site at the neighbor's house. Um, now, CCTV footage uh, from the murder, which uh, uh, provides a very interesting overview of what occurred, is in fact spliced. So it's missing key components. Now, uh, why that is the case is extremely mysterious. And then thirdly, as I pointed out, the sense that really there was too much to lose to find out who exactly um, was, was behind the murder in question. And so it remains uh, unsolved uh, killing one of many, as you know, in, in the Cape Flats. And it became a shock when I read that a very important document that was not even supposed to be in his hands was discovered in his house. Can you tell us about that document? Yes, I mean, this is really part of the, the overall mystery of, of the guns case. There's an intelligence report which detailed uh, essentially an attempt by the state to use an undercover informant uh, that person has not ever been named, and indeed the state has been very eager to keep that person's name out of the press. Um, uh, suffice to say that that person is relatively prominent in, in the underworld. And that intelligence report is a, or, or an investigation diary details uh, something of that operation. 
Hassan strangely had a copy of that in his files, which was discovered after his, his death. Um, and then the state moved quite quickly to try and um, retrieve that, et cetera, et cetera. It was indeed lawyers going through his boxes, et cetera, who, who found that particular case. And, and what that points to is connections between Hassan and, and at least uh, people within crime intelligence. Now, that's part of the general allegations of corruption that, as you see through the book, just occur again and again between different parts of the Western Cape Police and indeed the National Police, but in particular, the very uh, fraught position of, of crime intelligence in, in, in the province. And we can't talk about the Cape gangs and not talk about the two popular brothers, which were Rashid and Rashad Stahl. They were leaders of a, a gang called Hat Livings in Manenberg. Can you tell us how these brothers, they supplied their community with food parcels while they were also flooding Manenberg area with drugs? And not only Manenberg, indeed, I, I mm. would argue that they are have been both key intermediaries in the in the drag trade over the years uh, uh, no matter what is said about their, them withdrawing or not from illicit activities very much like uh, like criminal formations around the world let's take latin america and, or mexico during covid same occurred in south africa is this very strange dichotomy which actually turns out to be not so strange which is you make your money from communities by using them as drag users from which you make money, while at the same time, you provide a range of services. And, and that varies from purchase of TVs to food, to paying school fees, uh, to supporting young gang members um, when, when they are arrested, their families, etc. And this is really the, if you like, the dichotomy and the... the the power of, of local criminal figures, again, not only in South Africa, but, but South Africa really has uh, this challenge too. And what's the purpose of doing that? Well, the reality is that, that gangsterism is often about buying legitimacy locally. It's about governing. And so you challenge the legitimacy of the state, not only criminally, but also in a legitimate way. And, and you know, there's a very good example of this in, in the current case around Modak. You have people protesting outside the courtroom saying, he's a businessman, he buys us food, he runs a soup kitchen, etc. And it's this attempt to buy legitimacy, which the book covers in, in the case of the, of the Stucky brothers, now both dead. Uh, um, what's the result of that? Well, it's not only the purchase of legitimacy, but when you need, say, to hide guns or drugs, then by providing local support, you have houses where you can hide that sort of contraband. And when the police turn up looking for evidence or people to, to provide information, the mouths of communities literally shut. People don't come forward with, with information. Uh, not only do they fear violence, that would be true, but also they, they feel they owe an obligation to local gangsters. And in this problem is embedded a lot of the challenges we face about in these communities establishing or re-establishing um, state legitimacy. And I say establishing because in some communities, state legitimacy has always been relatively weak. You also write about uh, one of the brothers, Rashid, who, who was in jail, and at the time he proclaimed a conversion to faith, but some said he was still involved uh, in gang activities, especially in Westbury around Joburg. How did he manage to do that? The story of gang bosses is often about creating narratives um, of, of their lives, and finding religion is in fact a, a common one uh, um, in, the, in the gang context. Uh, amongst a range of different gang bosses, gang operatives, gang members. And in fact, in some cases, it's true in that uh, um, finding religion is a way to escape with a degree of legitimacy from the gang environment. In these particular cases, I would argue uh, that, in fact, uh, finding religion is a cover uh, uh, to create a narrative uh, despite the fact that illicit activity still uh, uh, continues. And you see that narrative in, in a number of, of places around the country, uh, this crossover between pastors and, and uh, illicit activity. So I think we should treat that with a great degree of, of, of caution. 
but the sense that that religion is a way out that you can have a convergence from terrible activities which cost lives and livelihoods to being a reconfigured uh, uh, spirit is, is not uncommon uh, um, as, as I've mentioned and, and particularly interesting. I think in this case it's a, it's a kind of at least from the information I have was a kind of uh, there's a sort of two-faced uh, um, laugh uh, uh, that is lived in this particular context. And, and we know that uh, Rashad was killed by the group Packard, but Rashid yeah. was also killed by Rashad's son over now a power struggle, which was a bit bizarre to me. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I mean, these are the allegations uh, uh, that you, Sunny, that you outlay very well. Firstly, to say the Pagad uh, uh, at the time killed a range of, of gang bosses and indeed caused major disruption to, to the gang economy of the Western Cape, but also allowed a, a, a range of new and sometimes more violent crime bosses to emerge. In the second case, the killing of by a member, allegedly by a member of, of the family, this is quite classic gang stuff, I have to say. And, and it occurs, you know, much more often than you would think. There's internal competition. You live by the gun. You die by the gun. Uh, um, there's jealousies that build up. There's conflicts that are often around uh, money. So, of course, when you look, and, and I have done this over a number of years, trying to establish who kills who uh, amongst different gang bosses. And as often as the killing is from an opposing gang, let's say, as often the, uh, the killing comes from internal competition with people jockeying for power, with jealousies around access to money, uh, with disputes around drugs, and uh, you know, people may be stealing part of a consignment and selling it and taking the money. And as a result, people, people die. Um, and, and I would argue that this is the case uh, yeah, and, and, and again, to reiterate, there's been a number of e examples like that. You know, the, the reality is that very often, you know, the case of Pagad was quite clear because, uh, uh, you know, the Pagad operatives were all there. It was, it was filmed by the media, etc. In many of the other cases, the cases just go unsolved, partly because nobody comes forward, partly because I think police investigators say, well, good riddance. There's the sense, well, okay, this is just another gang killing. Um, but this internal fractiousness, if you like, within gangs is very common. And lastly, Mark, would you agree now with those who say that the underworld is difficult to manage in our country because we have a lot of corrupt law officials, or do you think there is still hope? I think, to be honest, Sonny, the picture is very mixed. Um, I am hopeful... I have to say about recent big cases of underworld figures in the Western Cape. And I, I think those, those cases should be watched very, very closely. You hear rumors that emerge from people in and around those cases about their attempts or their hopes of being able to corrupt people within the police and the National Prosecuting Authority. And so the role of the media is, and others' research, et cetera, is very important to keep a spotlight um, on, on those cases. That there is widespread corruption between the gang environment and the police, I think you can take as a given, I'm afraid. And that occurs at a variety of levels. Firstly, the very cash-based system of the drug economy drives local corruption. So at, at a lower level, uh, you know, the exchange of, of money for release, et cetera linking back to the Hassan case, the payment to spring people from prison, but also at a higher level where millions of rands may be exchanged using pockets. Um, and, and in writing the book, I've heard too many stories to, it's just so common how often the, these sort of cases are recounted. There's a lot of misinformation too, of course. So uh, um, trying to uh, uh, peg corruption on some police officers and not on others. And then there's an additional element which you see often in the media, and that is the degree to which crime intelligence has been politicized. And that overlays with corruption and allegations of corruption and the like. So I think we need to be realistic about the challenges that, that we face. 
that the degree to which crime intelligence over the last decade or more has become compromised, factionalized, politicized, and that the real challenges that we as a country have to face and I would argue to some degree, we have a crisis within our police system. And I've mentioned, you know, many of the characteristics of this corruption, politicization, lack of skills, um, et cetera. That does not mean that there are not good officers uh, trying extremely hard to respond. But increasingly, the, those are pockets of, of expertise and non-corruptness, which, which have to be maintained and protected while a new system, literally in some places, a, a, a new system needs to be built. And, and I think that's the, the real challenge that, that we will face um, going forward. Last point to make, in the current cases that are going forward, when you remove key pieces or people from the underworld, you also need to plan for the future because there are individuals waiting to move into those positions. These are extremely lucrative occupations you need, as you, as I think you do, need to understand the difference between what you might call these gang bosses, these real organized crime figures, and the more the, the mass of ordinary gang members, often very violent, but coming from excluded communities with few options. And so the target needs to be to bring people in uh, from excluded uh, uh, communities that have lost faith in the state and, and the provision of ordinary services, while targeting at the top through the criminal justice system, in particular, the gang bosses. There was Mark Shaw in conversation with Quality about his book titled, Give Us More Guns.